This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their influences, including artists, writers, composers and musicians and filmmakers, and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's A Brush With, Kehinde Wiley, who, perhaps more than any other contemporary artist, has situated himself within the history of Western portrait painting. Kehinde makes direct references to the art of the past, quoting from artists like Holbein, Titian, Rubens, Gainsborough and David but replacing the royal, noble and ecclesiastical figures depicted by the old masters with ordinary people he's encountered on the street, mostly in New York, where he lives much of the time, but also in his grand ongoing project The World Stage in cities in Jamaica, India, Haiti, Nigeria, Brazil and beyond. Today, Kahinde has studios in Brooklyn, in Dakar, Senegal and in Beijing, China. Kehinde Wiley was born in Los Angeles in 1977 and began making art when he was very young. He grew up in South Central LA and has talked about how his mother, clearly an inspirational woman, was focused on ensuring that he and his siblings got out of the hood and immersed in culture. Kehinde first went to art school age 11 and early on became immersed in the historical art around him. But he also remembers another defining art experience as a child. He says he went to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and saw a barbershop painting by the great African-American painter Kerry James Marshall. Kehinde loved the work, he said, but added it was thrown into very sharp relief when thinking about the absence of other black images in that museum. His epiphany, the moment where his love of historic art met his desire to, as he puts it, see the people who look like him in art galleries, came when he was doing a residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York in 2001. There, he found a police mugshot of a young black man on a neighbourhood sidewalk, and he began to consider the negative portrayals of African American men in the media. He embarked on his landmark project Passing Posing, depicting young men from Harlem as saints and angels in poses inspired by Renaissance and Baroque paintings but also against zinging decorative backgrounds. That set the stage for everything that's followed. In Rumours of War, he took on the history of equestrian portraiture, creating vast works which reflect on the extreme depictions of leaders on horseback and how they reflected power and masculinity. He pointed out the absurdities of the form, the way that kings, princes and counts were enlarged by painters so they weren't dwarfed by the horses, for instance. Putting 21st century men in place of the historic figures immediately created a jarring effect, added to by the hallucinatory backgrounds where the tendrils of the floral wallpaper would creep across the figures. In 2007, Kehinde began the world stage, taking his work to the streets of cities beyond Harlem, working with local people and responding to the historical culture of those communities. Kehinde said that as he went from city to city, he began increasingly to notice the way that many people in other parts of the world interact with American culture is through black American expression, that in effect, hip-hop culture and American urban streetwear were African diasporic forms. Kehinde famously made portraits of some key hip-hop artists through a commission from VH1 in 2005, including Ice-T, LL Cool J, Big Daddy Kane, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Most of the people in his paintings are not famous, but those portrait commissions that he has done tend to have been so globally famous that they perhaps skew the impression of his practice. He painted an extraordinary portrait of Michael Jackson on horseback, for instance, in the style of Rubens's portrait of Philip II of Spain, which was completed after Jackson's death in 2009. And more recently, he made the painting for which he now best known, a portrait of President Barack Obama, which has been on a long tour of US museums. Up to a certain point, Wiley's portraits were of men, and he said that among other things they explore masculinity and queer desire. But he's also portrayed women, most notably in the series An Economy of Grace in 2012, and in his series Tricksters, in which he depicted some of the great women artists of our time, including Carrie Mae Weems and Lynette Yadon Boachi. Other artists he depicted included two former guests on this podcast, Glenn Ligon and Rashid Johnson. 
In the last few years, Kahinda has made some major shifts, first into the territory of landscape and seascape with his series In Search of the Miraculous, a title borrowed from the Dutch conceptual artist Bastian Arda. In that series, Kahinde drew on the works of artists including J.M.W. Turner and Winslow Homer, and again replaced their protagonists with contemporary figures from the African diaspora, making clear references to the histories of slavery and colonialism and the displacement and refugee crises of today. He's also developed a strand that he began as a student filmmaking with huge multi-screen video installations. The first was Naranshif in 2017, a film made in Haiti, directly quoting the post-colonial theories of Franz Fanon. And now he's made The Prelude, the centrepiece of an exhibition at the National Gallery in London, which is shown alongside five new paintings, two of which directly refer to the German romantic paintings of Caspar David Friedrich. It was at the opening of the National Show that I met Kahinde, and so this episode of the podcast is slightly different. First, you'll hear quotes from Kahinde's discussion with Christine Riding, the head of the curatorial department at the National Gallery and curator of the show, about the themes in the film and the paintings. And then he joined me for a conversation, beginning with the questions that I ask all our guests. Christine began by asking about the exhibition. What does it mean to him to collaborate with the National Gallery? First off, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for an opportunity to engage a nation, a history, a practice of painting that is very dear to me, specifically because we're in a site that is very loaded historically, very loaded in terms of the mastery of painting, but also the content within the work. Here you have paintings that bear history to the entire nation, but also they bear witness to uh, the British project globally. Painting is more than just a pretty picture on a wall. It's something that we espouse, something that points out into the world, something that at its best communicates our virtues. And here at the National Gallery, I have a very distinct opportunity to pivot towards the collection itself, to the museum as a site, uh, and also respond to London as a site. What's so uh, really fabulous about this film and this project is that I was able to do casting right here in London and allow them to populate and to people these paintings. And then now these, these works go up on the walls of a major British institution, really in an unprecedented way. So many of the portraits that you'll see in the rest of the museum are certainly people who have very uh, recognizable and established uh, careers and reputations. Uh, Most of the people in my paintings are completely unknown to me prior to the moment of impact. I call it the moment of impact because many of them are just minding their own business, trying to get to work, and here comes this guy tapping them on the shoulder. Uh, You know, I invite them to become part of the project, to look through art history books, to imagine themselves within this field of of power. And then I get to work. I I start to sort of uh, figure out which is the best pose, which is the best angle. Arriving at a state of grace, uh, oftentimes obsessed with this notion of respectability, dignity, that at its best is what portraiture can do. And I'm, I'm incredibly proud to be able to be here and do it. Kehinde has referred to the National Gallery show as a provocation. So he was then asked by Christine what he means by that. I think that art should do more than point. Art should have an opinion. It should be something that says, I believe in this more than that. Even if it's a bowl of fruit or flowers, it says that I believe in, the, let's see, bowl of fruit would be the existence of life over death. Even if it's a momentary thing, a collection of flowers, that the, the notion of paintings existing outside of time is a beautiful thing. And that's one of the reasons why we paint things that decay so quickly. What I wanted to capture outside of time were people who happened to look like me. What I wanted to look at was the language of discovery and voyage Uh, Oftentimes, when you look at these romantic paintings in the mountains, there's this sense of the lone, often white male figure looking off into the distance, uh, imagining his present tense, his future tense, and sort of, in a sense, finding himself. What happens if we flesh that out and open that envelope so that 
others might be able to be included in that notion. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to find oneself in that regard? So much of this has to do with traveling to far-flung places and imagining your body against these black skins and then able to somehow intuit who you truly are. This voyage of self-discovery with the backdrop of, of blackness or with the backdrop of Asianness or what have you. I think that that's certainly a problematic history, but I don't want to throw away the paintings. I'm in love with the art, so how do we find a way forward? How do we find a way through? This work attempts to at once embrace the material practice of Western easel painting, but also interrupt and create these types of provocations that allow us to see things on a slightly broader level. The film in the National Gallery exhibition, The Prelude, is named after a William Wordsworth poem, but features audio and subtitled excerpts from the American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on nature. The quotes Kahinde has chosen refer to the idea of the spiritual, of a universal being, and how nature should come through the human body and become immersed in it. So was that idea important for Kahinde? I think it's important when you guys go to see the film that you start to think about oughts. Are there any ought tos? with regard to nature. And I think this is one of the key questions that the transcendentalists and the naturalists were coming up against. You're in a space in which man is alone out in this world, and is there a type of a morality or ethic that exists in nature? At times, yes, is the response, and at times, no. I think what's really important for me, and one of the clues into this film has to do with Wordsworth's writing about childhood. The notion of the prelude comes from his writings in which he starts to talk about nature being as a relationship to youth in that sense of play, that sense of becoming, a radical contingency. Let's make mud cakes, let's make snow cakes, let's, let's become birds, let's be. This sense of constant becoming is at its core the reptilian mind of the child and perhaps the spiritual DNA of nature. What I wanted to do was to use this idea of absolute childhood as a remembrance point, to remember that young black boys in the streets of America are indeed children, regardless of their body language or the fact that they might be wearing hoodies or what have you. Oftentimes that sense of fear and that, that suspension of childhood, the inability to see them simply as, as baby boys and baby girls is something that's, that's incredibly chilling. So using this incredibly ancient language and trying to find a way through a theoretical conversation and esoteric assumptions and really trying to arrive at something that is practical, factual, consequential, uh, and beautiful. Uh, I oftentimes think that we don't have time to make simply beautiful paintings. Painting has to punch you in the gut and to point to something that you say yes to and, and something that you stand by. I think by and large museums as cultural institutions who've constantly been at the forefront of guarding what culture means and what culture will be handed down to the next generation has the fiduciary responsibility to recognize all of us and to say that all of our stories, all of our desires for grace and resplendence are here and, and recognized. In the film, nature is at its most brutal, but also profoundly beautiful. So Christine then asked what the experience was like in Norway, where it was filmed, and how does that experience translate into the work? Well, the sublime is definitely present in the film and in the paintings. But when thinking about the sublime, you also have to think about the larger than human, larger than life, temperatures that are inhospitable, an environment that literally will consume you within seconds. I wanted to use this sort of totemic notion of vast whiteness as a field through which we can look at structures of society, these small, warm, black bodies in consuming white, vast spaces. I wanted to talk about the brutality that existed historically with regards to the imperial and colonial project. I wanted to be able to use the landscape as a metaphor, not only of uh, survival and how people at their best can find a way to, to warm themselves, to play, to imagine their own childhoods and survivals, but I also wanted to reiterate uh, a type of hostility, brutality, that perhaps can be missed in a fixed oil painting. 
I think what's great about the film is that there's no acting involved. There's literally a moment in which we pivot from the exterior world and the torture that exists in the exterior world to the torture that one must experience inside as you pretend to be something safe in a world in which you're considered a constant threat. So the smile becomes this interesting metaphor that I think you guys should pay attention to when looking at the film. How does one at once project one thing when there's another going on inside? The people that Kahinde pictures in his works in the National Exhibition come from three continents, from Haiti in North America, from Senegal in Africa, and from London in Europe. And as Christine says, they're hugely important historically, because as she says, you have the transatlantic slave trade right there. So is that what he was trying to say with his casting for the people he pictures in this show? Well, it's a point of view, but it's also a matter of fact. My practice has me all over the world. I wanted to find boats that still look like that. I still wanted to find boats in which people sail uh, the same way that they would have 300 years ago. And so that allowed me to, st to begin to find models in Haiti, that allowed me to start to craft an image of something that looks at once 21st century if you look at their clothing, but oftentimes many of the clothing comes in tatters from secondhand stops from the Western world. The work is on three continents because I'm constantly going all over the world to, to scout and to find models. But I also wanted to create a project that referenced, in many ways, the sun never setting on the British Empire, the sense mm. in which mm. one can go throughout all diaspora and get a sense in which the UK has, has touched lives all over this planet. Um, what we're trying to do is go out into that world, pick up those shards, bring them back here, polish them off, and try to re-picture possibilities of who we can be moving forward into the future. So now, my conversation with Kahinde at the National Gallery. Kahinde, who was the first artist whose work you loved? I think the first artist whose work I love would be easily John Singer Sargent. I remember getting a book of his work and seeing it only in reproductions, but there was something about the sort of slashing of paint, the apparent ease with which the paintings were made, but then learning later on like how difficult it was to actually arrive at that sense of ease. So the sort of theatricality of ease or the false nature of ease was something that really struck me very early. I'm not aware of any direct quotations of Sargent in your work. Is there a direct quotation anywhere? There's a lack of theatricality in the posing of Sargent's work. I think a lot of the, the poses are quite staid and so they don't really come across as quotations at all, but rather just sort of uh, passive uh, figures. I think it's a little bit early on when you start looking at artists like Van Dyck, uh, like Gainsborough, that you get a much more sort of fashion of theatricality, the flash of, of a type of masculinity and bravado in painting. I think by the time you arrive at Sargent, you get a sense of puritanical, European slash American decency, <laughs> a sense of uh, a desire to pull back and to be uh, perhaps, uh, if not fully authentic, uh, modest. Indeed. Normally at this point I ask which historical artist you're turning to the most today. I know the answer to that question. That's Caspar David Friedrich, isn't it? <laughs> That's correct. I think when you look at this exhibition at the National Gallery in London, you'll see easily uh, influences in the paintings, but the film, I think, takes its cues most from Friedrich. What I wanted to do was to have models with deep, dark black skin being seen in sharp white backgrounds. And so I uh, street cast a number of models here in London and put them on a plane and went to the fjords in Norway and began this desire to this exploration to recreate Friedrich's landscapes in spirit. In spirit, I think um, one has to recognize that Friedrich was decidedly inventing the landscape as much as he was jotting it down or, or noting it. In the landscape of Friedrich, what you start to have are these impossibly totemic phalluses that stand as 
a signifier towards the rational world, the male mind, this closeness to God, the sense in which mountains themselves function as these immovable judges of all things valuable. What I wanted to do was to place black bodies within that space and to declare their value. One of the things that one might say about this body of work is because it's dealing with the sublime, because it's dealing with landscape, is if one was to take a cursory look, you might think it's, it's less political than some of your previous work, but it's not, is it? It's not one iota less political. No, in fact, it's decidedly more didactic to the degree that what we're talking about now is less about race, but the wholesale desire to consume land at large. It's the conquest of empire that's uh, indicted in most landscapes. I think it's easy for us to look at landscape paintings or still life paintings and assume that they're just simply docile images of things that will soon decay. But what we don't understand is that they're laying claim and stake to a whole series of things that we consider to be virtuous or valuable. And in this case, it's the land itself. One of the things that Prelude the film does, because it's on six screens, which sometimes mirror, sometimes repeat, you know, on either side of you, and then other times screens go blank, for instance, is it, is, is it, it works with scale very interestingly. And I'm interested in that generally about the way you interpret other artists. Because, of course, if there's the painting which is based on The Wander in the Sea of Fog by Friedrich, but the scale is entirely different. So can you tell me something about that, about the nature of scale in relation to working from an image right. that exists? No, scale is an incredibly important tool for any artist. I take my cues from artists from the sort of post-world abstract school who wanted to be able to create scale as something that contends with you, the human being, the sort of mega Motherwell painting, the, the mega Pollock that sort of demands that you step back and that you see yourself in direct relationship to it. The desire to create a kind of kaleidoscopic six screen experience really speaks to the desire to make something incomplete, that one never really has ever seen the film in its, in its totality. The sense of incompleteness I think has a direct relationship to the unfinished business of what it means to be British. What does it mean to be black? What does it mean to be any of these signifiers of identity? And to really work towards allowing a kind of uh, free flow between parts that we want to fix so, so decidedly. Art at its best allows us to point to things that are at once impossible uh, or ineffable and very sort of physically there. And in this sense, I wanted to create a film that gave you the sensation of a very full meal, but something's missing. There's a, a screen that's not quite seen. There's a, an itch that's not quite scratched. The way that you have filmed the bodies, these people in this landscape, is very much a balance of surrounded by landscape on the one instance and then extreme close-up and there's these there's this very slow process where you begin effectively a form of vast portraiture filmic portraiture and you close very steadily in and they're smiling can you explain what you were trying to do there what i was trying to do was to create a prison in this scene that you're describing each model is asked to smile for an hour which is impossible hmm. your muscles start to break down into spasms you start drooling all over yourself not to mention the fact that they're in this sub-zero degree environment with snow being blown at them at this incredibly unreasonable rate. I mean, this is not acting, this is surviving. And the prison of this space, the prison of this uh, performance exists in direct relationship to the performance that so many people of color have to do every single day when it comes to satisfying the expectations of what people see in you. You know the person you are on the inside, and you know what the outside world thinks of you. And so there's this weird conflict between the prison of inside and out and the negotiation of the self within that state of duress. Indeed. In the film and in this body of work which involves oceans and landscape, there are references to Bassianada. So, so this is a really intriguing reference because it seems to me to be 
outside of your usual frames of reference to a certain degree. His project in search of the miraculous, in one extreme, it was a failed attempt to cross the Atlantic. In fact, we, we assume he died in this process. Why Bastianada? What was, what was it about him? Well, I think it's the sadness that surrounds the project, the incomplete nature of it. There's something I love about the sort of heroic, incomplete failures that stand as uh, metaphors for so much of what the human project is. The desire to at once go out into the world and have this romantic sea excursion in which one finds oneself and returns triumphantly to the other end of the world ends in a, a tragic sea drowning, I'm assuming. Well, what does that say? It says that there is something incredibly beautiful about the tragic. Uh, that fracture, that fault line between the state of perfection and the state of decay is the sweet spot for painting. Mm. So I don't find my influences simply in the history of Western easel painting. I really love uh, scouring the full length and breadth of uh, conceptual practices uh, and, and sculptural practices, the, the entire material battery of what art history has to bear. That's a nice introduction to my next question, which is about contemporary art and which contemporary artists you admire the most. Well, some of the most exciting voices are the people who I grew up with, people who I went to graduate school with and who I fight with and contend with in terms of influence and, and jealousies. You know, you think about artists like Micheline Thomas and Julie Moretu and Hank Willis Thomas and Derek Adams. These are all people who live and work in New York, who come to my spaces in West Africa, who challenge me to be a better self. This is not uh, art history consumed through books, but rather through a state of community. And we hold each other up and we value each other, but we have cat fights like nobody's business. <laughs> That's great. And of course, so many of those figures appeared in your Trickster series. Tell us about that. Well, Trickster was a, an attempt to look at some of my peers and heroes in painting, but also to shoot it through the rubric of Goya's black paintings this kind of brooding darkness that finds itself in a very historical scale. But I wanted to embrace each one of these artists in a very personal way from uh, the point of view of a friend. And so I'm sort of shuttling back and forth between the space of the heroic and the intimate in a way that you start to see that these people exist within a certain cultural context, within a type of uh, uh, temporal context and hopefully you get a kind of vibe uh, that points to uh, something that portraiture is best at which is ultimately um, unspeakable but you know it when you see it that that is uh, Derek that is Micheline that is so and so this is um, the real challenge of painting and the real myth of painting as well which is that is portraiture ever capable of arriving at anything that approximates the individual that it desires to capture. My suspicion is that it's a series of yeses and nos, right? We, we kind of have facts of the matter, and we have facts about a person's life, but we also have a responsibility to put out more than that. I think we have a responsibility as storytellers not to simply reproduce fact. A biography is not a compendium of facts, but rather a, a type of dance surrounding those facts. And I think that portraiture itself is, is as well. The process that you use so often is a kind of tap on the shoulder in the street, mm. and then you then collaborate, as you said, with, right. with your sitter on choosing an image. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to explore how different that was when you made that series, Trickster, compared to those other series like World Stage right. and, and, and others. When you're portraying artists, you're working with artists who may have a similarly sort of rich knowledge of the history right. of portraiture that you do. So tell me about the, those, the differences of those two experiences. Well, I'm working with other tricksters. I'm working with other people who are in the, in the smoke and mirror business. What artists do is they take, especially painters, they take hairy sticks and colored paste and they coax those things into relatable image. They take ideas and turn them into plastic form. These people were my friends and, and were also my collaborators and co-conspirators in creating those images. 
And so what I asked many of them was to, to sort of try to imagine in a very direct way, which trickster figure could they imagine themselves being? And so there goes uh, the origin story as to why the show is then called Trickster. Right, that's great. You have several studios. And at this point, I normally ask, what do you have pinned to the studio wall? Right. Do you have around you the images that you're directly working from? Or do you have sort of images that are constantly around you, almost as a moral guide or a kind yeah. of, you know? That's always shifting. But for the last two years, I've been working in West Africa, where we have less in the way of a fixed project. One of the great things about the lockdown period is that I was creating work that wasn't slated for any particular exhibition. When I'm making exhibitions, I think thematically over several images and have to work on six to eight paintings at once, and it's, you know, it's, it's a multi-year process. Whereas with the paintings that I did in the lockdown period, they were much more playful, I think, much more uh, non-consequential. I had uh, less opportunity for failure because no one was going to see them. Right. Unless I wanted them to, right? And so it was a kind of cooker, a kind of experimental think tank or lab space in which I can start to imagine new possibilities of providence. So there were the images that we see in the paintings that we see in the National Gallery here behind us. They're not the paintings you're talking about. You made a whole different kind of work. Right. So there's, there's the official work that was going on. And then there was just like that space where you can just turn it all off. And you have to realize that when I was working in the, the studio in Senegal on the National Gallery paintings, we had no idea whether or not the National Gallery show was even going to happen just given where the world was at the time and uh, restrictions with regards to coming and going. So that actually sort of, in a, in a strange way, opens up a kind of psychic freedom so that you can go in and plug away at a potential thing, but you spend a much more of your time just drifting into this really comfortable studio practice that has very little consequence, very little surveillance, very little, um, I wouldn't say surveillance, because there were always friends and other artists coming by and, and seeing it. But I guess what I would say is psychological surveillance, that, that bar by which you measure yourself. And um, So are we going to see these ever? I don't know. I, I, I've saved a number of them for myself. I've allowed some very close friends to have some others. But more than anything, I think I'll probably be using them as studies to flesh out a number of directions. Interesting. Um, I could see a series of exhibitions coming from each one of these strange little, um, you know, accidents and uh, wormholes that I was finding myself in. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. The app offers access to around 50 cultural institutions through a single download, with new partners being added every month. Recent additions include digital guides to Aspen Art Museum and the Newark Museum of Art, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. As I said, one of Kahinde's great epiphanies as an artist when he found his style and subject matter happened when he was on a residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York in 2001. If you download the museum's guide on Bloomberg Connects, you can find out about the Artist in Residence programme, discover the present cohort of artists and explore audio and other materials to complement the annual exhibition on view at MoMA PS1, which you can also find on the app. To explore interactive guides to all the partnering institutions, download Bloomberg Connects today. You can find the app at bloombergconnects.org. It's also available to download from the App Store and Google Play. Let's talk about museums. Which museum do you visit the most? My favorite in New York is the Frick, although the Met is a close second. Something about the scale, the intimacy, and the sense in which it was like designed architecturally as someone's like private dwelling. What's it like seeing it in the Breuer building? A little bit uh, destabilizing. But, you know, I mean, it, you, have to, you have to move on and, and get it done. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the Huntington because it's such a central museum in your life. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your first experience of going to the Huntington. Well, you know, I started going to art school when I was like 11 years old as a kid. My mom sent me to art school as a way to keep me out of the streets of South Central Los Angeles where I was born. And me and my twin brother would go in two hours each direction to go to art school. 
And uh, part of the program included going to programs like the Huntington Library and Gardens Children's Program. And that's where I started first seeing uh, traditional British and French portraiture. I was fascinated by it. I think I was slightly uh, confused by it. I remember thinking, what's up with all the lap dogs and pearls? And, um, <laughs> did, you, did you think that early on? Yeah, why are there, no, I mean, why are there just, no black people represented here? No, I don't think it was very... It wasn't based on race so much as dress code. You have to realize that uh, one of the things that pops out to you most in most uh, European portraiture has to do with how to floss, how to flex, how to bling. African Americans are accused of being very ostentatious, but if you look at the history of Western easel painting, you'll find that the game was invented here. Um, and so I love the pomp and circumstance surrounding it, but I also love the sense of order and protocol. Strangely, what was once very uh, hyper-masculine in one painting, uh, at, in one era, in one t- a period in time, when I was a child, was then considered to be quite effeminate or effete. If you look at this sort of backward turn wrist and the, the elbow pushing out towards the viewer, this was the height of male bravado. Uh, now it just seems rather um, posy. Indeed it does. Yeah, I, mean, I should say that just as we're talking, we're surrounded by Grand Manor portraits. It couldn't be a better space to talk to you in. Precisely. In fact, I believe the directors of the museum uh, produced this hall of paintings as an experience to see before walking into the prelude. Which cultural experience changed the way that you see the world? Well, when I was about 12 years old, uh, my mother found something called the Center for U.S. USSR Initiatives. And that landed me in the forest of what was then called the Soviet Union. And so I studied art in the forests of Russia with young Russian kids under the auspices of the CIA. And it was like the most bizarre program, uh, part of one of those sort of ping pong politic things where you hope that American kids will influence Soviet kids and then the following year the Soviet kids come to America. But in the wash what happens is that my brain exploded. (laughs) My sense of the possible went far beyond South Central Los Angeles, a very underserved community at the time. And it gave me a sense of ownership and a sense of uh, inheriting the fullness of of not just uh, one place or or one set of practices, but it felt as though the entire history of art were something that I was heir to. Which writer or poet do you return to the most? I think in terms of fiction, well, no, just nonfiction as well. I think James Baldwin is one of those voices that uh, is so authentic and so familiar and so just like blazingly brilliant that it resonates in a way that is both creative in a poetic sense, but also uh, alights one's mind politically. I think he also gets into topics surrounding human sexuality as it interfaces with race that was very exciting to me as a child. In this current show, there's very direct references to poets. So you have mm. um, Emerson, Wordsworth, directly quoted in the, right. in, in the, in the film. Yeah. Obviously, it was, it was partly because you're looking at sublime landscape, That's but right. had, had you had them as sort of markers already in your reading? No, no. In fact, for this project, I had to take a deep dive into principally the American transcendentalist movement, something that doesn't necessarily come naturally to me, but uh, it was deeply enlightening in, in, insofar as it pointed to something that was a deep suspicion of mine, which is that um, romanticism isn't an American project, but the unfinished business of Europe. And so we're inheriting a whole set of cultural assumptions and practices that have to do with the desire to be unbound, a desire to to be torn away from rules and caste systems, and to throw ourselves fully into the mind and or nature. In terms of my own intellectual biography, I, I think the writers who set fire to my imagination most 
were probably not the ones that were so prescriptive, you know. Although, you know, I'd, I'd love Adorno and Foucault and Lacan and the, the, the Academy of the Mind, but, it, but there, there has to be something to be said for those moments of chance where you're going through a bookstore, remember those? Or a library. <laughs> and um, discovering, I remember ris- discovering Richard Dyer when I was a uh, kid, and he was engaged in something called whiteness studies, which back then was uh, a sort of feature of the developing practice of critical race theory. And whiteness studies sits in exact relationship to Native American studies, African American studies, Asian studies. The, the idea is that if whiteness is something that is anywhere and nowhere and ineffable but somehow influencing every aspect of design, culture, architecture, politics, science. Why is it so hard to pin down? And ultimately we arrive at the ridiculous nature of all of these uh, defining categories, the invention of race, the invention of uh, nationhood. All of them become sort of useless as, as tools at a certain point, at a certain altitude, we all become the same. And I think that Dyer is able to look at the rhetorical history of painting, follow it through the material practice of filmmaking, follow it through pop culture and queer studies, and, and, and really bring it alive, and less theoretical and something that's more consequential and actual. That's really fascinating. And he's very present in Prelude, isn't he? I mean, it, he it's, is. it's, yes, okay, he the is. direct quotes are Wordsworth and sure. Emerson, but sure, sure, Dyer is there too. Dyer is there as well, especially with regards to the notion of the mountain as the phallus and the, uh, the penetrative light of God from above. There's this incredibly sort of hypersexualized notion of the divine, which is the Old Testament that sense of justice, which is incredibly brutal and and all-consuming. What music or other audio do you listen to as you work? Well, now I've got the soundtrack of prelude my, the, this film in my mind. It was an incredible score created by uh, a young composer named uh, Niles Luther. Um, I am obsessed with this music and uh, hopefully uh, we'll work on other projects in the future. That's great. And of course, hip hop is so synonymous with your work. Are you a hip hop listener? I suppose just because your images of LL Cool J, for instance, and, and Ice-T are very, very famous. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, about 20 years ago, I did a, a couple of portraits of um, hip hop guys. But generally, I think what happens in the understanding of my work is that the clothing is urban. The clothing is black American culture. It's, it, it, the leading edge of black American culture is its music, its hip hop, its, its swagger, its, uh, its attitude. And it's also ultimately the leading edge of American exported sense of radiance throughout the world. What I love about hip hop is that it's also a tool through which so many people from all ports of call arrive at. Young people from Bangladesh to, uh, to Sao Paulo are demanding to tell their stories, their truths through the idiom of, of hip hop. It's um, something that is, uh, finds its birth in the 1970s in the Bronx through people skillfully playing with words as daggers. But very quickly and very soon you start to see it exported all over the world and, and reinvented in a kind of circular way. Now uh, you see MCs and artists in America being influenced by young Nigerian uh, musicians who are now changing the way that we think about black culture, pop culture, hip hop. What, what do these terms even mean after a while? Because it's so cacophonous. So the, the series of influences are just so manifold. That's what I love about the evolution of culture. And that's what I hope to contribute with in regards to painting. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? Well, you, one thing that I did when I was a kid was I, when I say a kid, I'm talking about like a graduate student. Uh, I used to make 
my own mother well paintings. I love the elegies to the Spanish Republic, and I could never afford one, so I just decided to make them. <laughs> and so those paintings are in my uh, home, and they're ones that I'm sort of incredibly embarrassed by, but as the years go by, really proud to have. That's wonderful. And last question, what's art for? Art is for us to deal with the existential fact of extinction. It's for us to be able to dance in the face of doom and to be able to create something that lives underneath the inevitable fact of our death. Kehinde, thank you so much. Thank you. Hinde Wiley, The Prelude, is at the National Gallery London until the 18th of April 2022. The Obama Portraits Tour is at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art until the 2nd of January next year. Anka Hinde is in 30 Americans at the Columbia Museum of Art in Columbia, South Carolina, until the 17th of January. And he's in the group show Fashioning Masculinities, the art of menswear, which opens at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London from the 19th of March next year. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the Art Newspaper podcast are Julian Mihalska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Bentle, Daniela Hathaway and Kabir Jalla. A big thank you to Kahinde Wiley and to Christine Riding. And that's it for this series and indeed for this year, but we'll be back with more episodes of A Brush With in 2022. See you then and bye for now. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.